Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Noor Kokiar, and I'm the Executive Director of the Washington State China Relations Council, which I'd like to mention is the oldest state level organization dedicated to improving the bilateral relationship between the US and China. Today's session is gonna focus on US exports to China, specifically from the four states of Idaho, Montana, Oregon, and Washington. The data on exports has been compiled into a detailed report by the US-China Business Council, who is the co-producer of today's webinar. Their work highlights exports by state and by congressional district. The US-China Business Council team will explain more about their report and go through their numbers with us in a moment or two. But today I'm pleased that we collaborate with several organizations based in our four featured states. I'd like to specifically mention these organizations and to specifically thank them for their participation. Our partners today are Business Oregon, the University of Montana, specifically the Maureen and Mike Mansfield Center, the Northwest China Council, and the US Commercial Service offices in Boise, Portland, and Seattle. Again, thanks to these groups for inviting their members and guests to participate in today's event. And now I'd like to introduce David Thomas, who is the Senior Vice President of the US-China Business Council. David will provide us with more information about the report. And before David takes over, let me give you a little biographical information about him. David has spent more than two decades um, in advising and advocating for business on international policy issues. David has worked as a trade association professional, an outside counsel and lobbyist, and a congressional trade committee staffer. Immediately before coming to the US-China Business Council, David served as a senior counsel of global policy and international trade at the Enter Entertainment Software Association. And prior to this, David served as vice president of trade policy at the Business Roundtable, which is an association of chief, chief executive officers of America's leading companies. David also served as counsel for the subcommittee on trade for the Ways and Means Committee within the US House of Representatives. And before I hand it over to David, let me just note that um, once the uh, presenters from USCBC uh, explain the report to us, we'll have some moderated Q&A, and then we'll go to audience Q&A. And if you have questions, please submit them uh, using the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of the screen, and we'll try our best uh, to get to all of our questions. So David, over to you. Uh, thank you, Noor, uh, for that introduction. And uh, thank you to the WSCRC uh, for co-hosting uh, today's event uh, with us at USCBC. Uh, likewise, uh, I want to thank uh, all of our other event co-hosts uh, that Nora mentioned. We appreciate your partnerships uh, as well. Um, you all have helped enormously to spread the word uh, about this event uh, and ensure that most uh, people uh, possible uh, could get an update on the American Northwest region's uh, export relationship uh, with China. Uh, let me first uh, start with a brief introduction of uh, USCBC. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan trade association uh, with offices in Washington, D.C., Shanghai, and Beijing, China. Uh, we represent more than 260 American companies uh, that do business in China. Our membership includes large companies as well as small and medium-sized enterprises from virtually every U.S. industry. Our chief goal is to foster a strong, fair, and reciprocal trade relationship with China by acting as a bridge uh, between both governments. Each year, our organization tracks uh, every American state and congressional district's goods and services export to China, as well as the jobs that are supported by those exports. We do this uh, to provide a more in-depth and data-driven snapshot of this aspect of the bilateral trade relationship. I should make a quick note uh, in terms of the data you'll hear more about here in a minute. In terms of goods exports, uh, we are looking at 2021 data. And when we reference services exports, we are looking at 2020 data. While 2020 may feel like uh, ages ago now, uh, it is the most recent year that we have comprehensive data on services for from the US government. Uh, the government releases this data after it releases goods data. And from that point, it still needs to be curated uh, or uh, work, worked uh, on by our staff to fill in gaps. And uh, so please bear with us keeping those differences in uh, the years in mind. I think you will find though that the 2020 services trends uh, still apply in 2022. 
uh, as well. Uh, so in today's event, uh, our uh, report authors are Ian Hutchinson and Aaron Slauson, and they will analyze the trends uh, in the latest national and state and congressional district export data um, and uh, for Washington State, Oregon, Montana, and Idaho in particular. Uh, I want to briefly introduce Ian and Aaron and then turn it over to them. Uh, Ian Hutchinson is USCBC's Senior Manager of Communication and Publications. He hosts the China Business Minute podcast, runs our website, and covers the Belt and Road Initiative portfolio. Aaron Slauson is our Senior Manager and Senior Editor of, for Communications and Publications. She leads the editing and production of all US CBC publications. So with that, I wanna thank both Ian and Aaron for preparing today's report and taking the time to present it to you. Uh, and I hope you, uh, our partners in the region, uh, find this helpful. Ian and Aaron. Awesome. Um, first off, Noor, thanks very much for the introduction and David as well, um, and to all of the organizations that are partnering with us for this event. Um, of course, in good old 2022 fashion, I will start this off with the traditional can you see my screen? Um, so we do have a, a quick slide deck to run through here. Um, myself and Aaron are the two authors of this report. Um, and today we're gonna dig into both the national level trends to give you sort of an, an overview of what US exports to China looked like in 2021 for goods and 2024 services. And then um, as has already been laid out, we've also got a breakdown of the, the four states in the, in the Northwest that we're looking at specifically. Um, so we can go ahead and get started at the national level here. So the, the kind of top line national story um, from U.S. exports to China was that goods exports in 2021 hit a record high of around $149 billion. That was up 21% from the year before, which itself was another sizable growth year for goods exports. Um, we've seen also services exports to China um, or the opposite end of the story. So again, as David mentioned, there's the sort of awkwardness that we have goods data for 2021 and services data for 2020. Um, it pains us too. So <laughs> we apologize for the discrepancy in years there. Um, but as one might expect in 2020, COVID-19 took a pretty impactful uh, hit to US services exports to China. Um, just for reference here, as I said earlier, um, US goods exports to China in 2020 stood at about 123 billion which itself was up 18% from the year before. So that was that kind of stair-stepping growth in U.S. goods exports. Um, and then U.S. jobs that are supported by all U.S. exports, so goods and services together in 2020, supported 858,486 American jobs. Um, and that was a slight decline, again, from the year before in 2019, partially as the, uh, the impacts, the negative impacts to U.S. services exports slightly outpaced the growth in goods exports. So looking specifically at goods exports, as I had mentioned, goods exports grew by 21% to a record high in 2021. This was driven primarily by oil seeds and grains was the, uh, the U.S.'s top goods export category. I think soybeans is really one of the, the major chunks there. It saw growth of $4.8 billion. So a lot of farmers in the Midwest um, exported a growing number of soybeans to China. Farmers sent around $22 billion worth of the uh, oil seeds and grain category to China. Semiconductor sales were also another really sizable one here, and that's something we're going to specifically talk about today, as Oregon is the real kind of cornerstone of, of U.S. Uh, semiconductor exports. Those sales of semiconductors grew by around $2 billion, and then oil and gas sales that are dominated by Texas and Louisiana for the most part um, grew by about $1.6 billion in 2021. Um, those were all categories being oil and gas, semiconductors, and oil seeds and grains. Those have traditionally for the past couple of years been pretty big export categories. Um, and then pharmaceuticals was one for the goods exports category that has grown pretty significantly and, and kind of made its way into the top five in 2021 where it wouldn't have been before. Um, exports of pharmaceuticals and medicines grew by about $2 billion and almost just shy of $8 billion for the, the total export categories there. If I can find the next button, here we go. This is a, a sort of tree map that gives you an idea of what the US exports in terms of goods to China. So this is 2021. And as you can see, it's very varied. The, the amount of goods that, US, that the US sends to China is very broad. So you have oil, seeds, and grain is the largest. 
semiconductors, oil and gas, pharmaceuticals, as we've mentioned, some of the other big categories are industrial machinery, and then navigational and measurement in instruments. Um, I know that's kind of an odd term to think GPS. Um, a lot of GPS equipment will follow under navigational and measurement instruments. And then you have cars as well. Aerospace products is one that has fallen in size, which we can talk a little bit about later, but this gives you a sort of general overview of what goods exports to China look like in 2021. And then here you have the, what essentially what it looks like across the country. So this map is specifically the change in goods exports from 2020 to 2021. So your heavier dark blue areas are obviously large growth. And then your red areas are a, a decline in those goods exports. So it gives you kind of a general picture of overall, we know that US goods exports to China grew in this period. So as you would expect, the map is mostly blue. Um, and you can see a couple standout spots where um, those exports declined. One of them being in Washington, which we can talk a little bit about later. But this gives you the sort of national overview of, of what the, the change in goods exports has looked like. And for services, I will turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Aaron Slauson, who uh, covered the services part of our report. Thanks, Ian. Um, and thank you to Nora and David and everyone uh, for making this event possible. So I'm gonna talk a bit about services exports. Um, I get to tell the negative story. Um, so yeah, on the, other, on the other hand from goods, we have services. Um, services exports in 2020 decreased by 33%, so they decreased by one third. Um, I don't think this is shocking to anyone because of what happened in 2020, um, which we're all aware of the pandemic. So international travel came to a halt and historically travel is the United States um, greatest services export to China. So just to put that into context, personal travel and tourism was down by 90%. And when I say it was down, I mean, um, personal travel and tourism exports from the U.S. to China were down by 90%. Business travel, down by 90%. Health-related travel, down by 79%. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, another category that's sort of travel adjacent is education services exports. So this is literally um, tuition paid by Chinese students at U.S. universities or other services that was down by 19 percent. So while the next slide will show that education services are the U.S., the United States greatest services export to China, um, those services are actually down this year. Next slide, please. I wish I could say that cough break was strategic, um, but it wasn't, but I'll, I'll give you a second to, um, to look at this tree map. So you can see that, <coughs> pardon me, you can see that education services are the United States largest export services export category to China. And then it's a good mix. You have um, financial services, um, intellectual, different types of intellectual property services. So trademark royalties, software distribution, other kinds of royalties, um, royalties from industrial products. You can see travel is way down there. Um, personal travel and tourism down at um, 0.9 billion. So in years past, that would be the size of education or more. Can you go on? Sorry, everyone, another area where I wish I could say that was strategic. Um, but you can see that across the board, services exports to China decreased. I think um, the smallest decrease was North Dakota, um, but that said, it's still a decrease. So if you look at some states that are very reliant on travel and tourism, like um, I'm thinking like Hawaii and Nevada, you can see that um, those states are colored dark red. Um, or at least part of Nevada is colored dark red. Alaska colored dark red. So um, you can see that those are the most uh, the most severe contractions. So yeah, across the board, uh, not a great story compared to goods. And then we have jobs. Um, <coughs> jobs are interesting. Um, jobs are calculated based on goods and services exports to China. So this is um, jobs that are directly supported and indirectly supported. So you can see, 
states that had a great year. So I'm thinking the Midwest ag states. Um, <coughs> for this group, Oregon's first district in 2020 had great years, um, but obviously services did not have a good year. So some states were not able to overcome that, but overall um, jobs down about 5%. <coughs> All right, I shall give Erin a, a merciful moment where she uh, <laughs> she doesn't have to be coughing on camera. Um, um, so now we wanted to take a more specific look at the Northwest. So the kind of states that are all represented here today by the, the various organizations. Um, we can start with goods. So you, you'll see a similar mirroring here of the national story. So in this case, you can kind of see the, the Northwest goods exports. Um, Washington stood at $2.8 billion in 2021, 10.3 for Oregon, and then smaller numbers for Montana and Idaho. Um, what one might expect, Washington and Oregon, are they have larger economies than, than Montana and Idaho. So similar, uh, similar kind of scaled exports. For Washington, um, we can talk a little bit more specifically. Um, aerospace products were one of the, the largest exports that Washington used to send to China. Um, as recently as 2018, those would have represented six to $7 billion um, worth of annual exports. Um, but that has, has fallen pretty precipitously and that, that has greatly shrunk the amount of exports that Washington is sending to China. Um, pops the next slide here. So these are the kind of top categories that the uh, the four states that we're talking about here export. So for Washington, like we said, aerospace products um, only represented $220 million worth of exports in 2021. And as I said, that would have represented upwards of $6 billion um, in, in you know, years past. But at the moment, navigational measurement instruments were one of the major exports for Washington. Oregon, another kind of clear story here is the growth of semiconductor and componentry. Um, it almost reached $8 billion, but stood at 7.9 in 2021. Um, Oregon's exports of semiconductors have grown fairly steadily over the past four years. Um, Oregon's um, home to the Silicon Forest, which is a sort of swath of, of semiconductor manufacturing plants. Um, and a lot of those chips would be exported to China. Um, ultimately, it would represent a relatively small amount of China's total imports of semiconductors. Um, but U.S. companies tend to manufacture higher end semiconductors for more advanced applications. Um, I wish we had more vision into our data, but for, for the trade nerds out there, um, we're using a four digit NAICS code. Um, so what we have is semiconductors here, um, but we don't have the specificity of, of what exactly the kind of chips that are being exported. But um, most likely it's representing higher end chips. Um, also for Oregon, industrial machinery and motor vehicles were big ones. Uh, Montana and Idaho both have more agricultural exports to China. So both Montana and Idaho exported a fairly healthy amount of oil seeds and grains. So they were kind of riding that wave of growing oil seeds and grain exports to China in 2021. For Montana, industrial machinery and then some non-iron metal products as well were exported. And then Idaho also has a fairly large dairy industry and did export some dairy products to China as well. So this is what the, the percentage of each state's goods exports globally went to China. So if that's a, a bit of a word salad, so 7% of Washington's total exports that we're saying globally went to China. For Oregon, you can see a really big chunk, more than a third of Oregon's total goods exports in 2021 went to China. So for Montana and Idaho, also slightly smaller amounts, but Oregon here is, is the real standout for China being the one of the largest export markets for the state. Again, really driven by semiconductors. And then for services, I will I will turn it back over to Aaron. Yeah, so I'll let everyone uh, take a second to take in this slide. So you can see clearly um, out of the four states, Washington state exports the most in services to China. Um, uh, and then Oregon, and then Idaho, and then Montana. Um, so even though in the other maps, uh, blue was used to represent um, an increase um, for all four of these states, um, these are actually quite significantly down from 2019. So uh, Washington services exports to China down 27%, Oregon down 30%, Montana down um, a whopping 46%. Um, that was the, the, the largest um, uh, contraction um, percentage-wise. 
um, Idaho down 35%. Next slide, please. Um, and so this gives you a picture of what those services exports actually look like. So for Washington, software distribution royalties are the top export. That makes sense. I don't think it'll be a surprise to anyone. Um, ocean freight and port services, um, those are actually up from 90 million the year prior. Um, that was one of the few categories where we saw an increase. Um, Oregon, royalties from industrial processes, education, software distribution royalties, and then Montana and Idaho, on, <clears throat> pardon me, Idaho um, education are the top, is the top um, services export. <coughs> What's noticeably missing here um, is travel and, and tourism. So, <clears throat> pardon me. So for Washington, travel used to be the third largest category. Um, same for Oregon, and then Montana and Idaho, travel used to be, used to be <clears throat> Um, the top category. So you can see in 2020, um, all four states are missing either their third or their, their first, or they're missing either their, their largest or their third largest export category. Um, <clears throat> there still was some travel going on, um, but not enough to be significant. Uh, definitely not enough to make it into the top three. Um, so just keep that in mind. Also, education makes it onto the list of top three for all four states. Um, but in all four cases, education exports are actually um, down from the year prior. So the only really standout increase you can really see here um, is ocean freight and port services in Washington state. Um, so I'm thinking like Port of Seattle, Tacoma, is probably the reason for that. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> even though these states have quite different services exports to China, um, they're kind of in the same range in terms of the percentage of their services exports or total services exports that go to China. So <coughs> you can see here they're between the five and seven and seven range. Excuse me, you can go to the next slide. <coughs> and Ian, I might ask you to take on the jobs numbers for me. Absolutely, no problem. Um, so as you can see here, um, I know you can all read 68,240 uh, is the number of jobs that were supported by these four states exports to China in 2020. Um, so that's the kind of the combination of, of all four states. And I will note that these are direct and indirect jobs. So some of these would be people who are working directly at exporters and some of them would be, you know, kind of supporting or secondary tertiary inputs to those exports. So that covers a, a pretty sizable amount of, of jobs in the region that are that are supported by these these exports to China. Um, and then here is a little map that kind of shows you where those are concentrated. So this is broken down to the congressional district level. Um, as you can see, Oregon's first here, where um, those semiconductor manufacturers are really uh, concentrated, is just shy of 34,000 of those jobs from the total region that are supported there. Um, so you can kind of see where the largest exports are, the largest jobs are, as you can, as you would assume. Um, Washington second up here kind of uh, is, is around 3,500. That would have been significantly larger in the past. In years past, it would have supported upwards of 30,000 US jobs. Um, but again, that has fallen pretty precipitously since, since 2018. Um, but this gives you a general idea of the sort of distribution of where these jobs that are supported by these exports kind of reside. And I believe, yes, I believe that is the end of our slide. Um, so at this stage, um, I thank you for your attention. And I think, Nora, did you want to go ahead and run into a moderated, uh, moderated section yeah. for? Yeah, let, let me ask a few questions, uh, um, mm -hmm. you and Aaron. And then again, I encourage the audience uh, to put their questions in the Q and A box. And I would, I might note that if we might need some help from the audience uh, if we get into specifics of states. If there's some uh, experts out there that might be able to help us with some of the questions, please put your hand up. And there's a raise hand function and, and we can call on you to help us uh, answer the question. So uh, Ian, you referred to it, uh, Oregon's first, the semiconductor uh, area. That, that's what, yeah, it's half of the jobs. Um, it's, it's very important, obviously, to US exports, it's very important to that district. Um, but I'm a little concerned, the US is restricting exports of semiconductors to China. So uh, is that, are the exports going to fall? And then the other side of that question might be China's imports of semiconductors I've seen have a decreased of late. And I know China has been prob probably stockpiling um, uh, 
uh, semiconductors, which may have produced higher numbers than, than normal. And also they're trying their best to develop their local industry for semiconductors. So do we have a feel for the outlook for those semiconductor exports? Um, I mean, it's a lot of questions packed in there for sure. Um, the, the kind of thing that I would say on Aaron and I's behalf is when we write these reports, um, every year we get our data sheet and every year we kind of dig into it and we find all these trends and every year we, we kind of get to the point where we're like, I would like to pro prognosticate about what might happen in the future. Mm -hmm. And then we always have to pull the reins in. <laughs> so this report, you'll, you'll find that all of the text in our report you'll find is very much it's analytical of the trends that we can see and we don't like to get out ahead of our skis. Um, for one, I, I would just kind of uh, kind of talk about Oregon specifically here. Oregon is a state, even though a lot of these semiconductor exports are are focused in that first district there. Um, just to give you guys an idea of kind of the growth of Oregon's exports to China, um, the only goods category that Oregon is sending to China that is in the billions of dollars is is semiconductors for the most part. In 2017, the total state exports were around four billion which grew to 5 billion in 2018, then jumped to 7 billion in 2019. And now is the whole state is resting at around $10 billion in total exports, around eight of which are semiconductors. So it really does dominate the state's economy. Um, our kind of understanding of part of the reason that the, the exports were growing, and I, I can't say how big or small that part is, but part of our understanding was that Chinese companies were importing more US semiconductors as you said, essentially we're stockpiling and kind of preparing for US sanctions. Um, so, so a small part of that could possibly explain it, but I would, I would just kind of point out that the amount of export, or excuse me, the amount of chips that China imports is very, very sizable. And even Oregon's exports, which are the largest in the US, still represent a very small portion of their total exports. Um, as for future policy stuff, I don't know, David, maybe do you have any, any thoughts on that that you'd like to toss in? Uh, thanks, Ian. Uh, yeah, no, it's a good question. And it's, yeah, it's always hard to predict the future, uh, certainly when it comes to politics in Washington, D.C. Um, but I think, you know, just picking up on that stockpiling point that Ian mentioned, right, Nora, we have seen uh, increased uh, U.S. export controls, right, by the Biden administration uh, over the last uh, at least half year or so. Uh, and we, we may see against, uh, uh, you know, uh, exports to SMIC, for example, which is China based. Uh, and we are watching to see if there'll be further uh, restrictions on exports of semiconductors and other uh, technologies that could be used for um, military as well as civil uh, applications, given the ongoing uh, tech uh, competition uh, between both governments. But we'll really have to see, because this again is 2021 goods uh, data, uh, and this is an evolving trend we're seeing, uh, you know, almost midway through 2022. So it'll be interesting, you know, this time next year, right, Ian, to see what the trends are and uh, how that reflects policy uh, initiatives by the U.S. administration over the course of this year. And, and I'd, I'd encourage anyone in the audience, maybe someone from Oregon, or, um, or, or Idaho, where they have semiconductor, the Micron is located. If any of you know um, some of the answers about the different types of chips or whatever, and why Oregon is so, um, so export uh, dominant, please, please raise your hand or let us know and we'll ask for your input. Um, I'd like to note that, um, as Ian made the point that China imports lots and lots of chips, I think the US today is 12% of the world semiconductor production. Whereas if you went back 15 years, 10, 15 years ago, it was like 50%. But as you said, David, um, well, as you imply, uh, Taiwan is a huge exporter. Um, obviously uh, South Korea with Samsung is a big exporter. So yeah, so the US um, is only 12% of the, the world's chip production. I can't tell you how much of those are exported or not. Okay, um, and the other big district that was, was highly impacted by this was Washington second. And uh, the whole state, again, I'm based in Washington and uh, going back to, I think 2017, our exports to China were like $14 billion. Now they're down to three. It's a huge, huge uh, decrease. And I would note that Boeing has not sold an airliner to China, I think since 2018. Um, 
and then there's been delivery problems, particularly the 737. So it's it's a it's a very dismal uh, situation. So do we have any anybody have a sense for when China might be buying planes again? I know they have their domestic airliner they're rolling out. Um, travel tourism travels down. So what's the outlook there? You're you're definitely right about Washington's uh, exports having fallen. So so like you said, your stat was right. Um, so in 2017 and 2018, both uh, Washington exported around 14 billion dollars in goods um, to China, and the vast bulk of that would have been aerospace products and parts. So that would have been full aircraft, and then also um, maintenance parts, essentially for for on the ground maintenance. Um, and yeah, since 2018, in 2019, it had fallen to five billion dollars. In 2020 and 2021, the whole state's exports um, represented around three billion dollars, um, and those aerospace products and parts only represented 220 million in 2021. So mm -hmm. it has fallen really precipitously. Um, in terms of um, China's you know, internal replacement, I know they're developing. I think it's the C919 is mm -hmm. their domestic yeah. equivalent. Um, I, I don't, I could be wrong, but I don't think that's at the stage where that would be replacing something that is produced by either Airbus or Boeing. Um, but I'm, I'm sure it, you know, it's, it's in development. So it's kind of impossible to say, you know, where that future will go. I don't, I don't know enough about the technicalities of aviation to make any call there. Um, but that's kind of where the trend sits. Um, David, do you have any thoughts? No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't add anything to that. I, I would add one point, I guess, that um, I think we have to be mindful of right nor the larger uh, political tensions yeah. between right. the two governments. Uh, and, uh, you know, there is a, a long history, right, uh, of uh, governments using different tools to try to uh, create leverage or pressure points. And, and I don't know this, but when you look historically, right, at the significance of uh, uh, aerospace um, aviation exports to China, right? It could be, I don't know this empirically, but it could be uh, that this is an example of a sector, right? That uh, has uh, uh, over the course of uh, the 2021 goods exports gotten caught in the middle, uh, mm -hmm. right? And been a victim of circumstance. Uh, and again, I think it'll be interesting to see over the next couple of years uh, I see there's a, uh, maybe I could segue this into a question in the chat box I see Noor uh, on uh, asking, what do right. you see as the effects of the Made in China 2025 plan on U.S. exports? And maybe to segue into that question, right, um, you know, there, uh, there was a, uh, a Section 301 investigation uh, by the U.S. Trade Reps Office during the Trump administration. Right, that was looking at uh, a range of uh, uh, unfair Chinese uh, trade and industrial practices that then has led uh, since uh, 2018, almost four, uh, four years ago now uh, in uh, July, uh, a series of tariffs uh, by the US on Chinese imports and retaliatory tariffs uh, by the Chinese government uh, the other way. And, and so on that China 2025 program, I'd really, uh, point out everyone to be watching. We, we expect uh, it could be eminent uh, an announcement by the U.S. Trade Reps Office of an additional Section 301 investigation that uh, focuses uh, even more on uh, uh, Chinese industrial uh, policies, uh, in particular around uh, sectors of strategic importance, um, you know, i.e. in the China 2025. Uh, plan. And uh, typically, uh, that type of USGR investigation uh, takes uh, eight to 12 months. Uh, but uh, as we saw a couple of years ago, it resulted in, in tariffs that are still ongoing and costing, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, for uh, U.S. Uh, companies of all sizes. Um, so I think it's, it, it, again, as Ian said, it, it, we're kind of at a midpoint and as the Biden administration's uh, China strategy and the tools they seek to employ, uh, like Section 301, as those play out uh, over the next uh, year or two, uh, we'll see uh, what impact that may or may not have on U.S. exports.
Yeah, and taking us back to semiconductors, I mean, that on their 2025 plan, that's well, front and center. And I know there's been lots of lots of government money been splashed around in China to try to, to boost that industry. So that's uh, that's it can be a real risk if America would, would lose those exports. Right. Um, you know, another area where we noted, particularly um, in Idaho and Montana, uh, oil seeds and grains uh, has increased. And again, that was part of the phase one trade agreement um, where agricultural exports were, were increased quite a bit. Um, it's a bit of a risk. I mean, just in today, if you're following the news and today, the one of the I think vice premiers or something was, was up in the northeast of China uh, exhorting farmers to grow more soybeans. And China has this plan to become self-sufficient in soybeans. Um, just for our viewers' edification, China is the world's biggest soybean importer. They import something like 100 million tons. And the next country down the list is Japan at 15 million. So they're by far this behemoth, um, which quite frankly, I do not think they could ever become self-sufficient if they wanted to continue to eat the way they're eating today. But I mean, this is, this is a risk that China, again, is trying to become self-sufficient in not only technologies like semiconductors, but even, even, in, um, even in agricultural goods. So that, that bodes ill for, for our group. I guess what I've heard from a number of our exporters is that they, they have a hard time with China because it's variability. I don't know if Ian or Aaron, you can you can respond to this, but you know, China will come in the market and buy huge amounts of grain, corn, wheat, soybeans, and then they might just, you know, particularly in corn, they might not show up for another two or three years. And I've heard that from our potato producers in the Pacific Northwest that they've you know bought lots of. They don't allow the um, import of raw potatoes, but they import I think French fries. So. Some years they'll buy lots and then other years they'll back off and it makes planning um, for exporters very, very difficult. So I don't know if either either of you two want to address that, but it, it's definitely an issue that's been raised uh, by some of our members and other folks I know in the Pacific Northwest. Mm, no, absolutely. I mean, to, to kind of give some, some overall context here and also just sort of maybe get away from not specifically the Northwest, but just to talk about oil seeds and grains in general. Um, like you mentioned earlier, I mean, those exports in 2021 of specifically oil seeds and grains. So that includes like soybeans, wheat, corn, I think soybeans would be the, the biggest one in that category. Um, they grew by almost $5 billion. So I think $4.8 billion is, is what it grew by in 2021. Um, so Illinois, Iowa, both saw more than half a billion dollars in, in growth. Minnesota also saw a lot. Um, the Dakotas also saw, saw a lot of growth there. So, I mean, like a lot of these agricultural producing states are sending more to China. Um, and, and to your point on, on policy, I, I think it's, it's probably true that, you know, any, any market where you're exporting a huge amount to, there is an inherent risk that that might change. Um, I can't really speak to how big a risk it is necessarily. Um, I, 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 my personal view is probably the same as yours, that I, I don't know if China would be able to be self-sufficient in soybeans just simply for the massive amount that it consumes on an annual basis. Um, so could things change in the future? Of course. Um, I mean, there's always a lot of uncertainty in these goods exports. Um, I mean, if you can pick any specific category of goods exports, it can fluctuate wildly from year to year for any country, China included. Um, but when your market is is that large, of course, it, it will you know seem scarier if, if if that's the bulk of your exports. But David, you, do you have any thoughts or Aaron? Um, I was just going to say, you know, I think this question was directed more um, more toward goods. Um, but if you look at services, I think for a very long time, uh, China's uh, you know purchases of U.S. services, as as odd as that sounds, uh, we're really talking about travel, education, royalties, financial services. Um, that was very predictable. Um, it was growing every year over the last decade. There's been consistent growth. Um, I think maybe in the last like three to five years, the growth had started plateauing, um, and then the pandemic happened, um, and now there's really no travel between the United States and China. So now it's very unpredictable. Um, and, you know, this is something that we're tracking all the time as a trade association specializing um, in U.S.-China trade. Um, so, I mean, for services, <clears throat> what does it look like moving forward with predictability? 
Um, <clears throat> We don't really know. I think when we get the data for 2021 and probably 2022, it's gonna look the same for travel as 2020. Um, yeah, predictability wasn't really, um, wasn't really an issue until now. Um, so I, I'm not sure if you have any comments on that, David. Yeah, I wish I, I, wish I did, Aaron, and Ian uh, and Noor. It, um, you know, I think another, right back on soybeans, Noor, the US-China phase one trade deal right, with the uh, purchase commitments, right, uh, that deal that was agreed to between uh, the, the Trump administration uh, and the uh, Chinese government. We're now, you know, uh, a couple of years into that. And, um, you know, when you look across the range of purchase commitments, certainly uh, in the ag area, uh, it's, uh, it's been a standout, but still, um, not the not the, the the full level of committed purchases right uh, to date, and um, you know the, you know based on public reports, the Chinese government cites that uh, you know a key term of that agreement was that it was subject to market conditions, right quote unquote, and uh, it uh, and and certainly uh, uh, given uh, COVID and the pandemic, it's been a very different market, uh, right. Uh, in the ensuing uh, two years since that agreement was signed. Um, so, you know, it'll be interesting to see, to bring that back to the policy area with the Biden administration, you know, their sort of ongoing um, uh, review of the last administration's China policy. Uh, Secretary Blinken was expected last week to uh, give a speech on the Biden administration's China strategy, but uh, he reportedly, unfortunately, tested positive for COVID, so was not able to give that speech. So you know, we've all been waiting uh, for more than a year to get more specifics, right, on uh, this uh, Biden administration's China strategy and what it means uh, for uh, uh, trade patterns like Aaron and Ian have uh, described from 2020 and 2021, but what it means going forward. And so unfortunately, I think we're still in a uh, uh, largely in a wait and see uh, mode. Yeah, and and uh, I mean, China is the biggest trading partner for Europe. It's the biggest trading partner for Southeast Asia, other parts of the world. And I mean, the biggest complaint I've probably heard from international business people that I deal with is that the U.S. does not seem to have a coherent trade policy, um, whether it's for China or whether it's for other parts of the world. That's something that everyone's been waiting for the administration to kind of roll out. So um, it would be it would be good to hear what Blinken had to say and see what how trade what part trade play plays into that. Um, yeah, back yeah, on agriculture, I would just say because my background again, I was with Cargill for thirty plus years. Um, China, if you look at the numbers, China is steadily buying more from non-U.S. countries as far as agricultural goods. Um, I. Don't quote me, but I think the number or maybe 10 years ago when you talk about grains and oil seeds and other products was like 30% of their food imports were from the U.S. It's last thing I saw was down to maybe 18%. So some of that is the rise, at least prior to February 24th, the rise of Ukraine and Russia exporting more and more wheat. Um, but I think some of it probably was a conscious policy on the part of the Chinese to diversify their source of, of foodstuffs. So that, um, again... It's not maybe a good sign for the future of, of uh, U.S. agricultural exports. Okay, again, uh, from the audience, we'd love to see questions. We'd love to hear your questions. Um, we've only had one come in. Ah, okay, here, here comes the new one. So let, let's see if we can say. Uh, what's the effects of Belt and Road on egg exports from the U.S.? Anybody be able to talk about that? And I, again, Belt and Road in general uh, and how that's impacting U.S. exports. In terms of how it would affect U.S. exports to China, um, it would be indirectly, I suppose. Um, my understanding is that a lot of the recent investments we've seen in Belt and Road countries, um, while there are some that are focused on, on food, sec food security, essentially um, looking to source you know, more food imports, agricultural imports from third countries along the Belt and Road to China, um, one could, I guess, argue that those would indirectly compete with with US agricultural exports. Um, that would, I guess, be the argument that one could make. Um, but my understanding is that a lot of the, especially recent uh, Belt and Road investments we've seen have been focused a lot more 
on things like uh, commodity access that aren't necessarily food. Um, so a lot of the uh, investment projects in Africa are, are for access to certain kinds of raw minerals that are used as inputs in a lot of manufacturing processes. And so I, I don't want to I don't want to kind of say that there's there's no major agricultural products along the Belt and Road. There certainly are some, um, but I, I don't think that those would be directly competing with U.S. agricultural inputs in a way that would cause massive massive swings essentially in other words i wouldn't expect to see in you know a year or two china essentially moving all of their agricultural imports from you know the us to belt and road countries instead exclusively it's it's not necessarily a, a kind of zero sum game there i i would i would say yeah from, ag from an agriculture point of view it's not practically pro possible you know if you want to buy 10 million tons of corn there aren't many places you can go to get Exactly. Can't exactly. Yes, it's always going to be high in the list. Right. Right. Um, uh, a, a question from the audience about the COVID policy, and I know that's probably not the expertise of, of any of us on this call, but uh, any indications from what you're hearing in Washington or your sources about any changes in the COVID policy? It's still, as far as we know, zero zero COVID, which means the uh, exports are, from China are slowed down. Obviously, imports are slowed down because the ports are impacted. People's buying behavior is impacted. And any comments there? Yeah, no, it's a good question. Uh, we're obviously watching uh, the COVID trends very closely, uh, as are our member companies. Um, we all have uh, uh, staff, in our case, we have, as I mentioned at the outset of this call, we have offices in Shanghai. Uh, we have staff there and, and in Beijing. Um, you know, just to use our organization as an example, our staff's been uh, unfortunately in lockdown uh, in their homes, in their apartments uh, for almost two months. Uh, and uh, you know, we, we're staying very close to our member companies that have operations in the Shanghai region uh, who are also trying to stay close to their employees, you know, both Chinese nationals and U.S. citizens that work there. And it's, uh, we do not see any evidence of a softening of the zero COVID policy. Um, it's, uh, you know, from all our uh, anecdotal information from our staff and our member company staff, uh, it's, it's created extreme hardships uh, for individuals and families. Uh, we certainly um, all appreciate the need uh, uh, for uh, public health and safety, um, but uh, there's obvious, um, you know, concerns. There's reports of um, uh, families being separated when a child tests positive, but the parents don't, right? And, and so there's those types of individual family concerns. Uh, to bring it back to business, right, we're all all of us are all too aware of the, um, um, you know, shutdowns within hours of businesses, uh, manufacturing or other operations uh, in Shanghai, as in other parts of China over many months, um, and uh, uh, the supply chain disruptions, right, that come to that. Uh, and, you know, we're, um, among other things, you know, trying to uh, stay in touch with our members about what are the um, uh, implications of the supply chain business disruptions, obviously for their operations in China, but because so many of our 260 member companies are, they're in China for China overwhelmingly in terms of their business, but China is such a huge market, right? It's, it's critical to our member companies global competitiveness, right? Not just in China, not just in the US, but globally. And so it's really the implications, right, for the global supply chains that we continue to watch uh, closely. To bring that back to the second part of the question here, uh, this how can China's policy of zero COVID coincide with President Xi's comments about a strong economy? Um, you know, really hard to say, right? Uh, 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 the uh, President Xi and his government are, are aiming for 5.5% uh, uh, growth uh, this year. Um, many think that is, uh, uh, growth was lower last year uh, in terms of what was publicly reported. Many observers think the publicly reported figure from last year was higher than it was in reality. 
And that uh, the first quarter trend, uh, many think, is lower than what was publicly reported. Uh, I'd also add a political layer to that lastly, right, that it's uh, uh, the 20th Party Congress uh, in China uh, is expected in October or November. Uh, and I don't think it's any secret that, uh, you know, President Xi uh, is looking for uh, as, as stable an environment uh, as possible running up to that. And so I think we, what we see so far is a, uh, a, a doubling down on the zero COVID policy that um, um, the President Xi's government, President Xi himself uh, has embraced. And so I think there's a lot at stake uh, reputationally uh, uh, for President Xi and his government around this year at COVID policy as well. So we, we had a, a webinar last week where we actually had two um, people from Washington who are now living in Shanghai um, beam up you know, from, their, from their houses in Shanghai and talk about the experiences they were, um, they were experiencing. Um, you know, at, at, during during the presentation, the one lady got a WeChat message from her local committee said, "You need to come down now to get tested." So it was it was really quite interesting. But both anecdotally, and I've read it now in a survey by AmCham uh, in Beijing, is the only thing that uh, we might experience is a big exodus of expats um, coming out of China because of the hardships that fam that you talk about families have had, et cetera, which will really, which could potentially hurt American companies operating in China for China and even uh, companies trying to sell product into, into China. Uh, the Washington State Department of Commerce um, as an example of wants to go on trade missions to China, but of course they can't. And of course, then the, the Chinese party comes back and says, well, hire a local company to be your representative. Well, that's good but you still want to be there on the ground. You still need to meet people face to face. So that's, that's going to be difficult. Um, Aaron, uh, we had a question about what's the outlook for PNW goods and services. And, you know, I, I was impressed when I first moved to hear that like uh, Washington exports lots of architectural services to, to China. A lot of buildings are designed and even outfitted with stuff that comes from Washington companies. And, and again, education you talked about. So, is there any any feel for the outlook of PNW services? Um, I know you addressed this a bit earlier, but yeah. Yeah, um, like Ian mentioned, we we try to stay away from forecasting too much um, and just looking at the 2020 numbers, which is the latest uh, set that we have, can also be a little bit misleading just because uh, 2020 was a, a weird year for um, purchasing habits. Uh, but if you look at over, over the last 10 years, um, consistently the top exports from the United States are, um, aside from travel, um, it's different types of um, intellectual property and financial services. So intellectual property, you know, it's not an industry, um, but it really comes from um, American innovation. It comes from American, uh, you know, works of art, movie, um, movies, Television. So, for example, in 2020, I think one of the one of the only categories of royalties that saw an increase was movies and television, which uh, makes sense since everyone was at home. Um, so, it's it's hard to say uh, a particular industry, but I would say uh, for services, anything involving like a trademark or copyright, anything that comes from an artistic work or uh, an industrial process or software. Um, I would say there's there. I, I hesitate to say there's a room for growth there, just because I'm not an industry expert. But if you look at the data, that's really where you're seeing um, consistent growth each year. But that said, um, in 2020, for example, like um, in Washington State, Washington's top um, services export category is uh, software distribution royalties. Um, I think it was. 444 million in 2020, that was actually down by 7%. Um, so it's it's really hard to say if, uh, if it would have increased had it not been for COVID and purchasing habits hadn't changed um, and, and, and there was a lot of business uncertainty. So I think it makes sense that across the board, a lot of, uh, a lot of categories that, that would have seen growth didn't. Um, but yeah, I would just go back to anything involving 
uh, American innovation, whether it be a work of art or, um, you know, some sort of industrial process. I wish I could give a more straightforward answer. Um, if you, if this uh, program was with New York, I would say financial services, um, but the Pacific Northwest tends to not be a huge financial services capital for, for the U.S., um, so I'll, I'll stay away from that. But nationally, financial services, I think, uh, is an area where we see growth every year. And, and how Washington at 444 million, how big is that in services exports compared to some other states? Is, is New York in the billions? How do we rank on that? Any idea? Um, let me check on that for you. I actually have, I actually have everything open right now. Um, I think from at the top of my memory, New York and California tend to be tend to be at the very top, different districts in New York and California for services, but let me check on that. And and Ian, the same telling the same questions for goods. How how do we stack up? What's what's who's the top exporting state? And what's the number? Do you, do you know that? Um, if Oregon is at 10 billion, um, is Oregon the second or third or fourth biggest exporter to China? Let me pull it up here. Us being the capital nerds that we are, we have our little Excel yes. sheet <laughs> all can, ready to go. I, I can chime in on services. Um, so top services exporters to China by state in 2020, number one's California, then New York. Um, Dropping down to number seven is Washington, um, okay. but Washington is the only state from from this group that is on the list of the top ten. Um, let me scroll down to districts. So yeah, Washington's seventh district. Um, if you look at the district level, is actually the only district from this region that's on there. Um, Washington's seventh district is on there at four hundred twenty-three million. Right. Um, okay. Uh, year over year, that's that's still down twenty-four percent. Uh, but the fact that Washington 7th District made it onto the list of top 10 district services exporters, uh, I think is still noteworthy. And for and Ian, goods, oh, and, uh, Okay, and Ian, over to you on goods. Yeah, um, so Oregon's in the top three. Oregon's three. Um, mm -hmm. by, by goods exports in 2021, Texas was the largest um, at 21 billion. So a lot of oil and gas exports from, from Texas there. Um, California, it being the largest economy in the country, one would expect it's also a good exporter. Um, it exported 16 billion, and then Oregon is three at 10.3 billion dollars in terms of goods exports. Um, and then in terms of Washington, is at 2021. 20, so you're going a little further down the down the list to find the other ones. But Oregon's semiconductors exports kind of keep it up there in the in the top three for for 2021 for goods. Right. Okay, we're coming we're coming up towards time. Um, I guess. My biggest observation was I was not aware that Oregon was a number three and that the exports out of, but again, some being having moved to Washington in 2017 when the number was like 14 billion over the export, I thought Washington was the, the Goliath in the region uh, exporting to, to China. But obviously, uh, that's not the case. That Oregon is really shot to the top here. And again, my concern. I hope, hope they can continue in that role. My concern, of course, is the um, trade winds of uh, the geopolitical situation and uh, China's industrial policy, which, quite frankly, might might uh, dislodge Oregon from that position. Any uh, any closing comments that anyone would like to make? Uh, it looks like maybe one last question has come in. Um, um, I ah. would say um, yeah, just to, to encourage everyone who's on the call here, um, this report is, of course, free, um, and, and pretty much all of the data for every individual district is completely available. So if you if you go to our website, we have a little reports tab, and if you um, go to all reports, it'll be right there at the top. I think it's also on our little rotator on our homepage at uschina.org. Um, but we absolutely encourage you, go digging through the data. There's a 436-page long PDF file of uh, every single congressional district's exports. Oh, thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, the link there is in the chat. Um, but yeah, it has a page for every single congressional district's goods and services exports to China. Everyone has a 10 year graph, the top exports, the top export markets. Um, so if you guys have any other questions about your, uh, your particular district or a particular industry, feel free to reach out to Aaron or I, we're both happy to go dig in for more, more answers for you. If you have questions. Great, great. Well, uh, we have a question from Tiff Roberts, who's our representative in Montana, and we haven't talked much about Montana, so let's let's take that on before we close, and that's about beef exports. 
So beef exports were up to China. And I guess the, the question would be any, 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 I know you don't like to predict, um, but any outlook, any issues on the beef area? And Tiff, from my experience, again, having Cargill as a big beef exporter, beef can also be political. Um, when China doesn't like something the U.S. Uh, does, that they will, um, they'll find a phytosanitary reason to ban beef, which I can do with other agriculture products. But that that is one I think that is um, that I think China the demand for beef is certainly up. Um, people would would certainly like to eat more beef, but um, it, it is one that could be volatile because of the way China um, uses it somewhat as a tool on the political situation. Uh, uh, Ian, you got a comment on that one? Um, so, so beef, I know specifically, um, we have our, our director of business advisory services, Jack Kamensky, he covers our agriculture portfolio. And if you want to talk about the niceties of beef exports with someone, Jack Kamensky is probably your man. Um, but as I, I know this is going to be a real nerd point. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, we use four digit NAICS codes. Um, so the, the three, one, one, six category for meat, um, it doesn't break out what the different kinds of meat are. So the, the meat products are, are just 3116 totally. Um, so for our data, we don't have specific stuff for beef, but I know that there have been some regulatory challenges around, around beef. Um, I don't know enough to say anything definitively. So I would be happy to connect you with Jack Kamensky. He probably would have some better ideas about the, the regulatory landscape around some of those. Cause I do know that there have been some kind of prickly issues around, around beef and antibiotics used in beef that's exported to China. Um, so I know there's a, a real regulatory snare there that I, I won't touch because I'm not knowledgeable enough. <laughs> right. And from uh, from my background, yes, that's China banned some parts uh, of the animal that couldn't be imported. I think they opened it up not too long ago. So, yes, there's there's a bunch back and forth. And thank you, Elizabeth, for putting Jack's com comment in there. So, again, it's time to wrap up. Uh, again, I want to thank all the presenters for uh, the for uh, ex expert presentation. And um, as Ian said, the report is available so people can access it. And I use it quite frequently when I talk to different people in, uh, around the state of Washington in particular and talk about if I want to know what the exports are to China, US CBC is my go-to spot. Again, um, let me just mention one more time, thank you to Business Oregon, the University of Montana, the Maureen and Mike Mansfield Center, the Northwest China Council, and the US Commercial Service offices in Boise, Portland, and Seattle for helping us uh, today to put this program on. So again, thanks, thanks everyone. And we'll sign off now. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you.